I've, I've been wondering how heart patients find out about new drugs and new procedures that can help them. I've learned more information that has helped me from investigating programs for mended hearts. Now I have better questions to ask my cardiologist than ever before. For example, wasn't our talk last month by Kaiser Oakland's pharmacist, Dr. Yen Tang, great? Yes. <laughs> she, she told us about the new diabetes type 2 drugs that are all over the TV commercials that are able to reduce your weight and deal with the heart problems associated with diabetes. <laughs> And I hope everyone got an invitation to view the webinar from Mended Hearts National, the one last month on different types of heart failure and different care. We oh. learned that cardiac amyloidosis can present with the same symptoms as heart failure and is frequently underdiagnosed. Then we learned about the two tests that will diagnose cardiac amyloidosis and a potent new drug that can treat it. Uh, this webinar can be viewed through Mended Heart's YouTube channel, and I've put the address in the chat, if you see it there, that you can copy and paste in your browser or on to your computer. Also coming up from Mended Heart's National is another free webinar on March 15th this month called Understanding the Linkage Between LDL Cholesterol and Cardiovascular Risk. This is another topic that our chapter has had a similar program on in the past with Dr. Raskin. Let me know in the chat if you need an invitation for this new webinar from National and I'll email it to you. Today's webinar should be able to help us understand more about atrial fibrillation, how to prevent it, diagnose it, and treat it. Dr. Desai gave this talk last May to Mended Hearts National. It's on their website, along with some great brochures and questions to ask your doctors. There are many new videos out there on AFib. Dr. Desai calls his approach a holistic approach because it requires inputs from many different sources and takes into account the socioeconomic uh, emotional, socio-emotional needs of the patient. He will explain what this team consists of, and he also said that his lectures come, as I said uh, before, from hearing from patients that their doctors told them nothing more could be done for their AFib, and there is. He also wrote a book about thriving with AFib. His presentation has some of the best graphics I have seen. He uses them, so I'll turn the closed captioning off every now and then so that we can see what he's pointing at. His lecture is only 40 minutes, and then the last 15 minutes at the end is for questions uh, from the original uh, webinar audience, and I learned a lot from his answers on those, too. So, unless there are questions, I will... Um, share my screen. Getting there. <laughs> okay. And here we go. So now I would like to uh, introduce to you our speaker for the day. Can you hear? Dr. Desai, oh, well, better, better. Inherited heart rhythm specialist, cardiac electrophysiologist in Orange County, California. Dr. Desai, thank you so much for being here with us today. I am going to turn it over to you and you can take it away. Sounds great, Andrea. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and welcome to everyone on the webinar today. I'm very excited to do this. 
actually have some AFib patients that I saw today, so it's fresh in my mind. And the reality of AFib is any of us can get affected by it. One in four people over the age of 40 at some point in our lives. And so on this webinar, we're at risk and there's a lot we can do to help prevent AFib for each of us and our loved ones. As Andrea mentioned, I am in Southern California, in Orange County, California, and I've been an electrophysiologist out here for about 17 years. I trained at Stanford. And as an electrophysiologist, we live and breathe AFib every day. We do everything from the diagnosis to the treatment modalities, and we work with our cardiology colleagues. And what's nice nowadays is that we have discrete AFib specialists such as ourselves that patients can reach out to, and we can work with the rest of your healthcare team to help manage atrial fib and be as proactive as possible. So one of my maxims in terms of just dealing with health, because I've had my own health issues and my family has as well, and I strongly believe in empowerment, and I love what Mended Hearts is doing, and I'm very appreciative of the opportunity today to speak with you. Living with a health condition, regardless of what it is, is a combination of accepting it, having hope, and making a game plan, and that's the key. It's about really enlisting the help of your healthcare providers, your family, your friends, and taking it upon yourselves to get informed. So the more informed you are, the better questions you can ask, and better the outcome. So I want to start by introducing you to a wonderful lady. She's from Germany and her name is Esther. And this picture was actually taken at our hospital. We had recently completed our thousandth robotic ablation procedure for AFib, which I'll touch on later. And Esther came into my office referred from a cardiologist. She was miserable. Her heart rate was running fast. She was chronically fatigued. Her legs were swelling. She couldn't breathe. And she was referred to see me to see if I could help evaluate. And we did an EKG as one of the first steps in evaluating Esther's heart. And many of you, I'm sure, are aware of what an EKG is, and we'll come to that in a second. But if we could just take a step back and think of the heart as an engine, it's the easiest way for me to think about it. It's a much more complex structure, but an engine works. And it has valves, it has blood flow, it has electricity. The electricity runs the heart, the valves keep the blood moving in the right direction, and then the three coronary arteries provide the heart with nutrients and blood supply. With the electrical system, you can have what are called cardiac arrhythmias, and these are abnormalities of the rhythm, can originate from any of the four chambers, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, or left ventricle. And the cells in these different chambers have the ability to independently send signals and cause abnormal rhythms. What you see on the right part of the screen is the cardiac conduction system. So in yellow is outlined what the normal electrical system is. So our heartbeat starts in the sinus node, which is in the top right portion of the right atrium. It goes down to the center, which is the AV node, and then it branches out in the bundle branches for the right and left ventricle. And the impulses travel in that fashion. But as I mentioned, you can have impulses originate from any of these chambers. AFib originates from the left atrium. Ventricular tachycardia, especially if it's related to a heart attack, originates often from the left ventricle, sometimes the right ventricle. So you get the idea. We come back to the EKG and Esther. What is done with the EKG is several electrodes are hooked up to essentially record the heart's electrical impulses and rhythm from different vantage points. If you imagine each of those leads as almost like a watchtower, and it's watching the heart impulses as they go through the heart. So we can tell a lot about what the heart is doing in terms of its rhythm, its rate, and whether the impulses are traveling normally. Are they going normal speed? Or are they going too slow? Or are they going too fast? The problem with EKG is it's a split second in time. And what we know about the heart's electrical system is it's kind of like your house in, in your car. The system can work sometimes and not work other times. And sort of like taking your car to the mechanic, you may come to your doctor's office or go to an emergency room and have a completely normal EKG, even though it was acting up at home. So it's an important thing to keep in mind. 
So if we look at Esther's EKG, we'll look at these different leads. So you see these different letters. Those just describe the different electrodes and vantage points looking at the heart's rhythm. And one thing of note, and I'll show this in another slide, is that each of these spikes that you see here is a heartbeat. It's a representation of the two ventricles contracting called the QRS complex. Well, prior to each of those spikes, what we should see in a normal rhythm, what's called normal sinus rhythm, is a small hump called the P wave. And there should be a one-to-one -one relationship between that small hump and the big spike. There also should be a relatively equal distance between the spikes. And so what we see here is the spikes are actually chaotically moving. You see some that are slow and then some are fast. So right off the bat, we see a rapid irregular rhythm. So what Esther's EKG tells us is that, again, on the left side is Esther's EKG. So let's look at a normal EKG. Normal EKG in the center here shows that small hump, what I call the P wave, which represents both the right and left atria contracting. And then the QRS, which reflects the ventricles contracting. And so there's a one-to-one -one relationship called normal sinus rhythm. And you can see on the right here, Esther's EKG at the top shows no clear hump of that P wave before every QRS. And in fact, we see almost what looks like noise, electrical noise. That's atrial fibrillation, that's AFib. It's a chaotic rhythm. The atrium is actually contracting almost 600 beats a minute, but the heart has a safety mechanism in place called the AV node. And what that structure does is it only allows a certain number of those impulses through so that the heart's not going 600 beats a minute because if that happened, one would have a cardiac arrest. And so on the lower panel, you can see the normal sinus rhythm in the P wave. So if we look a little bit deeper at atrial fibrillation on the right panel is a picture of the heart the electrical system and an EKG at the bottom. And this is normal sinus rhythm, this left-sided picture. On the right, we see atrial fibrillation. And with AFib, the top left chamber is the source of the arrhythmia in the vast majority of patients. There are four veins called the pulmonary veins, and these almost act as castles of AFib, if you will, that send out sparks from the castle, triggering a fire outside the catheter is the best way to think about it. And so these impulses are chaotic and they result in the heart not contracting normally, which can lead to several different problems. Here is a picture of that EKG and breaking down the actual heartbeat. We can see the P wave, we can see the QRS, and it just shows you the sequence of activation in the heart's electrical system. So I mentioned it earlier, but let's come back to it. What really is AFib? It's the most common heart rhythm disorder worldwide. In this country, about 6 million people right now have AFib, 750 hospitalizations per year in the U.S. It's estimated that in about 20 to 25 years, there is going to be almost 16 million people that will have AFib. So it's really important that we identify how to prevent the arrhythmia and if people do have it, how to treat it and treat it well and monitor for any recurrences. So with AFib, the consequences include stroke, which is the most catastrophic. And the way that happens is the left atrium, when it's fibrillating, when it's beating chaotically in an ineffective way, the blood just pools there and stagnates, forms a clot, and travels to the arterial system, to any organ really. The brain is the most common, but it actually can go to other blood vessels. We've seen cases where someone has, for example, bowel ischemia or bowel infarction in their GI tract because the clot went from the heart through the mesenteric arterial system, which is the blood flow to the GI system. So it really, these clots can go anywhere. That's the most catastrophic aspect of AFib. And if you look at people who come into the hospital with stroke, about 30 to 40% of cases, we can't identify the cause. It wasn't the carotid artery. It wasn't a plaque in the aorta. It was actually AFib in many of those cases. And AFib can be silent. It's a silent killer, similar to high blood pressure. And it's really the advent of different kinds of heart rhythm monitors that we've been able to detect these silent episodes of AFib and identify patients that may be at future risk for stroke. So that's an important point. A person can have a stroke at home, come to the hospital, be in a normal rhythm, but they had AFib 12 hours prior. 
And this is that example of the heart's electrical system coming and going, and, and it can be really tricky to make a diagnosis. Congestive heart failure happens as a result, two reasons really. One is the heart beats really fast and irregularly. So the heart doesn't have enough time to fill up with blood in order to pump it out. That causes what we call diastolic heart failure or heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. If that heartbeat goes fast enough, long enough, it can actually weaken the heart muscle, causing systolic heart failure, where the heart muscle and what's called the ejection fraction actually drop. And there's an actual term for that called tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy, which basically refers to a fast abnormal rhythm weakening the heart muscle. The neat thing about treating that is that if you restore the rhythm and control the heart rate, you can actually restore heart muscle function. So it is one of those reversible causes. Of <laughs> the symptoms of AFib can be tricky. Many people think, well, it's a rapid irregular rhythm. I should feel some heart palpitations. I should feel something. Well, in fact, many cases, people just feel tired. They feel fatigued. They feel short of breath. They may have some leg swelling. They may not feel heart-related symptoms. It's not like the coronary artery. When someone's having a heart attack and an artery is blocked, it typically causes pain in the of the chest. AFib is not that way. We've seen patients get diagnosed in a pre-op visit for gallbladder surgery. And when you ask that person, well, can you notice anything? They say, well, can you really trust them? Over the last three to six months, I haven't been able to do what I want to do. And many people blame it really on the aging part, which is completely understandable because we get older, you're not able to do as much. But in fact, AFib can be for that. And restoring the rhythm can actually help make those symptoms get significantly better. So there's different kinds of atrial fibrillation. That's where AFib starts and stops. And that's how AFib originates. That's how it begins. And it's really a helpful analogy. I think of it as electrical cancer. Every time you have an episode of AFib, it creates a muscle memory in the heart because the heart's a muscle to facilitate more aid. It really grows circuits similar to what a cancer would do. You can stop that process. So if the process has always progressed, you can do a lot of things to help people as well. So paroxysmal AFib is where you go in and out of AFib, and the body and the heart are able to get back into a normal rhythm. Persistent AFib, which is in the middle here, is where you're in continuous AFib, and that AFib either can occur for less than one year, which is called for regular persistent AFib, or if it goes on for more than a year, it's long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. And permanent atrial fibrillation, which is down at the bottom, is where a person's in continuous AFib and doctor has tried to do numerous things to try to get them into rhythm, or they've been in AFib for such a long period of time it's felt that any attempt to get them into normal rhythm carries more risk than benefit. But you, this is not a fixed timeline. We've had patients go from persistent AFib to paroxysmal. We've had patients that were diagnosed as permanent AFib get to normal sinus rhythm. And that's the important part, and I'm glad we're having this webinar today. There's a lot of misinformation about AFib, about the treatments we have, about the risks, about the success rates. It's really important to get properly informed in the best way is with a heart rhythm specialist. On the right slide, you see the prevalence of AFib. It increases significantly with age. So over the age of 65, we see a very steep increase in the incidence of AFib. And then on the bottom, we see that increase in the number of people that will have AFib over time. Right now, about 6 million and projected in 2050 at around 16 million. When I think of AFib, I think of wood and I think of a fire. So the wood, like the risk, the risk factors of AFib is like the wood. And so that would include age, that would include coronary artery disease or any kind of structural heart disease, valve disease, for example. Sleep apnea is a big one that is under-recognized. High blood pressure, diabetes, congestive heart failure. Obesity is another key risk factor for AFib that we haven't really appreciated how much that has an impact. I've had people in continuous AFib that once they've lost 20 pounds, their rhythm literally converts back to normal. The same thing with sleep apnea. Once that's treated, the heart rhythm normalizes. So the body is interconnected and we need to really think about AFib in that holistic way. 
The last piece to mention is premature atrial contractions or PACs. These are premature beats that can occur as a sort of a skipping heartbeat. And a lot of times people are told those are benign, those are harmless. And in many cases they are. But if someone has enough of them day to day and they have other risk factors for AFib, that can actually create the substrate or the, the, the environment to trigger AFib. So think of the risk factors as the wood for the fire. And if risk factors are not controlled, that wood gets drier and drier and drier. So diabetes is out of control, high blood pressure is out of control, sleep apnea hasn't been diagnosed, and it's often underdiagnosed. So those are important things to keep in mind. I put up athleticism here as well. Athleticism is something increasingly recognized. And what I mean is high endurance athletes, extreme sports, the resting heart rate is often very low, and it's that low resting heart rate, which is due to the vagus nerve, part of the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the counterbalance to your fight or flight response or your sympathetic nervous system. We found that that vagus nerve, that slow heart rate that can be seen in athletes can be actually a trigger for AFib, especially if it's in conjunction with other risk factors. And genetics do play a role. We're learning more and more about genetics. We're not quite there yet, but we've definitely identified genes associated with risk of AFib. And by the way, what you're seeing in the middle here, this picture, this is the left atrium. This is the top left chamber of the heart that's the source of AFib. And these four tubular structures are the pulmonary veins, the source of AFib. So we talked about the risk factors, which is the wood. The triggers, the trigger, triggers are really the matches. They're the sparks that light the wood. And so in this particular case, if we just go through the circle here, dehydration is a common trigger for an AFib episode. So what I'm talking about is an episode of AFib, not the disease. So if someone has risk factors for the disease or develops the disease, you can have episodes get triggered. And people often wonder, I wasn't doing anything. I just went into AFib. And usually if you do enough detective work, there's some combination of factors, some perfect storm that resulted in an episode. Often that comes in the form of maybe being a little dehydrated. Sometimes high levels of emotional stress because of that brain-heart connection, stress can be a trigger for heart rhythm disturbances. Poor sleep hygiene, caffeine, alcohol is a big one. Alcohol, unfortunately, even very small amounts are not good for anyone at risk or who has AFib. So we advise our patients to actually not drink alcohol. There was a recent study at the University of California in San Francisco, and they infused small amounts of intravenous alcohol during an AFib ablation procedure, and they found that there were acute changes in the heart's electrical tissue just from the alcohol itself. What's interesting is electrolyte deficiency also is a contributor, and specifically magnesium and potassium. We are big proponents of people taking magnesium in particular because it has a very protective effect on heart health, blood pressure, and arrhythmias, as well as numerous other health benefits. Eating. So the GI tract is innervated by the vagus nerve, as is the heart. So this dual innervation of the nervous system, of the sympathetic and parasympathetic, can actually create problems. So we have people, for example, that get acid reflux or eat a large meal, and that triggers an episode of AFib for them. And it's important to spend this time thinking about risk factors and triggers because those are things, in many cases, we can control. And the last thing we want to do is offer a medication or an invasive procedure if the AFib can be managed other ways. In many cases, you need to do more than just risk factor and trigger modification. But if you treat these issues, these lifestyle issues, before the diagnosis of AFib, you will help prevent the diagnosis of AFib. The diagnosis of AFib, besides the EKG, like I showed in Esther's case, is often made with heart rhythm monitoring. So on the left here, you see the Holter monitor. That's a 24 to 48 hour continuous rhythm recording. It's not very helpful to diagnose AFib because AFib comes and goes, especially in the beginning. So this is only a snapshot of time. Telemetry monitors or event recorders are good for about four weeks. So that's better. We have a longer sampling of time. And in many cases, doing a monitor like this, especially if someone is having frequent enough symptoms, can often lead to the diagnosis of AFib. And by the way, these monitors now have sophisticated algorithms to auto-detect AFib. And in other words, if someone has an hour of AFib in the middle of the night and are unaware of it, the monitor actually will diagnose the AFib send it to the doctor for review. 
So that has been a big breakthrough in terms of detecting silent AFib and preventing stroke. On the right screen, you see a patch monitor. So this has been an exciting piece of technology out for a few years. There's no wires. It's very easy to wear. It's just a, a patch that's applied to the skin. It has a microchip in it that records the rhythm continuously. And there's two kinds of patches now, one where it continuously records for two weeks. The patch is sent into the company that processes the data and then the doctor reviews it. And now a new patch has just come out that actually sends in transmissions on a daily basis in case there's any rhythm issues found. On the left, you see different wearable devices. So down at the bottom, the Apple Watch Series 4, Series 5, and most recently Series 6, has the ability to record an EKG, as does the Cardio Mobile device, which is a finger pad sensor. What's nice about these is they're actually pretty accurate at detecting AFib if it says AFib. The problem is the electrode contact with the finger, because if you don't have good electrode contact, you'll get a lot of noise, and the rhythm will either not be able to be interpreted by the physician, or if you have a lot of skipping beats or other disturbances in rhythm, it will be hard to diagnose AFib. They do have their value though, and we have been able to diagnose AFib with patients doing recordings like this, bringing them into the office, and it saved a lot of hassle in terms of ordering several other tests. And then lastly, the implantable monitors, the loop monitors, these have been a breakthrough in technology for the last several years. It's literally injected under the skin with a local anesthetic. It continuously records the heart rhythm for up to four years. And now a new generation has come out that works with a smartphone. So you have an app on the phone that basically connects with Bluetooth with this device automatically without you needing to be involved. And anywhere you have a cell signal, those signals can then be sent to the doctor. If you have AFib, five minutes in the middle of the night, we'll know about it. And this is important. Using that analogy of cancer, every episode of AFib triggers more AFib. We need to stay on top of it. So the monitors are important, not just for diagnosis, but after treatment, if someone is on medication, if someone receives an ablation procedure, if someone has risk factor and trigger modification, we need a way to follow this disease over time. It's like doing a mammogram for breast cancer. This is our way, these monitors are our way to assess this electrical cancer. And so if you look at the drugs used to treat AFib, if risk factor and diet and lifestyle modifications aren't enough, we then go to drug therapy. So there's two types. There's antiarrhythmic drugs on the left, and there are rate control drugs on the right. So the rate control drugs are beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin. Beta blockers like atenolol, metoprolol, calcium channel blockers like diltiazem. These are designed to slow the heart rate if someone's in AFib. So they don't convert the rhythm. They're designed to slow the heart rate so the heart rate doesn't go too fast. They do help in reducing those premature beats that can act as a trigger for AFib. So they are very helpful. But long term, they're only about 50% successful at really helping manage the AFib. Antiarrhythmic drugs are designed to help keep people in rhythm, to help prevent episodes of AFib. And some antiarrhythmic drugs can actually help convert AFib back to normal sinus rhythm, what we call a chemical conversion. The problem with these drugs is they affect all aspects of the heart, not just the atria. They affect the ventricles. So people who have any structural heart disease, heart surgery, heart attack history, heart failure, valve disease, really have limited options with these drugs because many of them cause dangerous abnormal rhythms in the ventricle. And so scientists have worked on trying to find atrial specific drugs that just work on the atrium and it is a real challenge. It's different than other areas of medicine like cancer, for example, where you have immunotherapy to treat different targets. We don't have that same thing in arrhythmia medicine and hopefully we will one day. But drugs by and large have only about a 40, 50% success rate long-term. And if a drug works initially, at some point it often doesn't work. Now this isn't meant to say no one should be on a drug. It's just saying the drugs are just not what we need to manage this disease in many patients. Cardioversion is a procedure where we deliver an electrical impulse to reset the heart's rhythm. And so what that does is if someone's in atrial fibrillation, it resets the rhythm back to normal rhythm. And in many cases, it works acutely. The issue is that the AFib can recur. 
And the recurrence rate of AFib has to do with many factors. One is, are there ongoing risk factors and triggers that haven't been treated? Is the patient having very elevated blood pressure that needs to be controlled? Those things can re-trigger after a cardioversion. Left atrial size, the size of the chamber that creates AFib, is a big predictor of recurrence after cardioversion, or any treatment for that matter. So an echocardiogram or an ultrasound is an important test to do to check the left atrial size, to have an idea of how much has this AFib progressed. And that's an important test to ask your doctor about, is your left atrial size. Even if you don't have AFib, if your left atrial size is enlarged, that increases your risk of atrial fibrillation. And we do see that size improve over time if you keep someone in normal sinus rhythm. And we come now to ablation. So ablation is a strategy by which you're determining abnormal cells and you're delivering an energy source to destroy those cells. And it's used in different parts of the body, the heart, the spine, there's uterine ablation for, for bleeding, for fibroids. And so with the heart, AFib ablation was invented in the mid nineties, undergone multiple evolutions over time. And with AFib ablation, really what's done, it's a relatively simple procedure. We identify the four pulmonary veins in the left atrium. We have a three-dimensional mapping technology, almost like GPS, tells us exactly where to go. And then we bring our ablation catheter over to those sites, deliver the energy, and then remap to make sure that the AFib has resolved. And the challenge has been, the technology has not been great over many years when it first started. So people were having high recurrence rates. There were concerns about risk and safety. That's not the case now. Now we've looked at success rates for paroxysmal patients, for example, as high as 90%. For persistent patients who we even couldn't get into normal rhythm before, we're able to get into normal rhythm 70 to 80% of the time. The key with AFib is you have to individualize to the patient. It's, it's not really helpful to compare stories with other people who have had treatments there are so many factors that influence the treatment outcome of an ablation for procedure, for example. Were the risk factors being treated alongside with the ablation? If someone is obese and they get an ablation, they're still gonna be at higher risk for AFib recurring unless they lose weight. And that's an important expectation to have realistically set is that this is not a single fix. This is part of a treatment plan. So AFib ablation is indicated for people who have symptomatic atrial fibrillation, especially if it's failing drug therapy. But more recent studies have now shown if you go to ablation earlier in the treatment algorithm, that you will have a better outcome because it's targeting that electrical cancer early. Doing the drug therapy route and then ablation, there's nothing wrong with that. But as electrophysiologists, we often see people on drugs for a very long period of time before they finally get referred to us and at, by that point, the AFib has already progressed. So the point being is that ablation technology has improved dramatically. We have success rates in paroxysmal patients as high as 90%, persistent patients, as I mentioned. And don't think of it as just one treatment. Sometimes we'll do an ablation plus a drug or a device like a pacemaker. So it really depends. In paroxysmal patients, in most cases, ablation alone is sufficient. That has a very high cure rate. If people have recurrences, there's different reasons for that. And if they need another procedure, nowadays, it's much easier to go through. It's a same day discharge, it's a quick recovery, and the risk, generally speaking, is about 1% for any major complications. And so AFib ablation has really come a long way. There's two primary sources used. One is cryoballoon or freezing. The other is radiofrequency or heating. We also have robotic catheter ablation, which uses magnetic fields to direct the catheter. And there are advantages to each of these and really think of things as having a toolbox. I've had cases, for example, where I use a cryo balloon, but there may be areas that I can't get to with the balloon, so I trade it out for a radio frequency catheter. The robotic catheter is not available at most facilities. This is a very expensive piece of equipment. We are fortunate at our hospital, at Providence Mission Hospital, to have this system called stereotaxis. What's nice about it is the catheter is ultra soft, so it can't traumatize the heart muscle. It has a millimeter accuracy and we can control everything with the computer mouse. So it's really an incredible piece of technology. We don't do all our ablations with this because there are certain trade-offs. So you really want to individualize to the patient. The cryo balloon is, is a relatively easy procedure. You just place the balloon at the base of each of the pulmonary veins 
and let it do its job. So the theme of this is ablation is a highly effective treatment approach. Ask your doctor about it if that is a consideration in your treatment plan. There are patients who are not candidates for ablation. But the important thing is really to probe your healthcare provider to find out what are the options? Why am I a candidate for metoprolol? Why am I a candidate for a pacemaker? Or why should I get an ablation? What are my other options? It's really about doing that research. In continuing the story about ablation, just two other points. One is conversion AFib ablation. It's a form of what's called a maze procedure. A maze procedure is done by a cardiothoracic surgeon at the time of heart surgery. And what they do essentially is they do ablation around the heart, on the outside of the heart, the epicardial surface. Well, the problem with the maze procedure is it's difficult to assess at the end of the procedure that you were successful. And we actually see many patients have their AFib come back after maze procedures. So convergent was invented. And so what that does is the surgeon and the electrophysiologist partner together. The surgeon does the epicardial portion of the ablation first, which is on the back part of the heart called the posterior wall. It's a big part of AFib in terms of origin. And then the electrophysiologist six weeks later goes in and does mapping to identify what's been already ablated, what needs to be touched up. It's almost like a combined hybrid technique. And it can be highly effective for people who have recurrent AFib or patients who fail conventional ablation. We were actually the first hospital on the West Coast to offer this. So it definitely has its role. I would not recommend people go to this as a first line strategy. It is a little bit more invasive. With traditional ablation, everything is basically done through a small insertion site in the right femoral vein. And so with conversion ablation, it's a little bit more invasive. AV node ablation on the right side, this is a procedure that was commonly done in the past, but is less done now, mainly because we have so many other great treatment options for AFib. AV node ablation has its role. What we do here is we cauterize that central electrical system. If you remember before, I was talking about how that AV node protects our heart from it going too fast. Well, if the heart rate is going too fast despite medication, despite a, perhaps even a prior ablation, and the person is still in AFib, and it's causing heart failure and symptoms, you can actually cauterize the central electrical system. What that does is it slows the heart rate way down. So you have to put in a pacemaker in conjunction, or if you already have a pacemaker, then it's even easier to help regulate the heartbeat. So the top part of the heart is fibrillating still. So you need to address stroke protection. What that means is either a blood thinner like Eliquis or Xarelto or Warfarin or Pradaxa, or one of the newer devices like Watchman, for example, to help protect against stroke. Those things still need to be done. And those are things that are important to address as well in general with AFib that we can touch upon later. But with the AV node ablation, you still need to take care of that stroke risk, but it does slow the heart and helps regulate the heartbeat. This slide is about the three-dimensional mapping that I was referring to. At the top, you can see the left atrium. We created an anatomic shell with this system. It's almost like an artist in a paintbrush. So these catheters have multiple tiny electrodes that record electrical signals. And then an algorithm, a computer algorithm, translates those signals over to color. So it shows us areas of color and what that color means. So in this particular case, that purple that you see within the tubes here before ablation within these white lines, that's abnormal signal. That's what you see as a cause of AFib. They're called pulmonary vein potentials. Those are the triggers for AFib. Those are the matches. And what we do is we create a circle of ablation around those veins, essentially isolating them from triggering AFib to the rest of the heart. That's what we're ablating when we're ablating AFib. We're creating a circle of insulation, of electrical insulation around a broken wire is the best way to think about it. And so the before ablation looks like this, and after you do an ablation and you eliminate those circuits, you see just red in the veins. And red means the signal is gone. So purple means the signal is there. Red means the signal is gone. So you have immediate gratification. I mentioned the pacemakers. So pacemakers are not a primary treatment for AFib, but often an adjunctive treatment. Many cases of AFib, a person's heart rate goes fast and slow, called tachycardia bradycardia syndrome. Pacemakers are used to as, act as a safety net to prevent the heart rate from getting too low. That's what they are. They're a safety net. They don't really 
they're not really designed to treat rapid heart rhythm. That being said, there are some pacemakers now that have algorithms in them to help treat atrial fibrillation episodes and another rhythm called atrial flutter. And so again, it's not used as a primary treatment, but as an adjunct of treatment. Now, if someone gets an AV node ablation, for example, if they're in continuous AFib, fast heart rate, and it's ultimately decided AV node ablation is the best strategy, they may be a candidate for what's called a leadless pacemaker, where there's no wires in the heart. Traditional pacemaker, you have a battery under the skin, you have wires going in the subclavian vein. With a leadless pacemaker, it's like a micro pellet that goes in the heart inserted through the right femoral vein. You can't even tell you have a pacemaker. It's an amazing piece of technology. It has a sort of niche application in certain settings, but it really is a great option for patients, especially people who are in continuous AFib. If someone's in normal sinus rhythm, we are working on ways to do leadless pacing in that setting, but primarily it's indicated for ventricular pacing. I wanted to just mention as uh, talking about pacemakers, here we have Frances, and Frances is just an amazing person. She's 105. She is a great, great grandmother, and she was born about three months before World War II. She has a dual chamber pacemaker, and it was implanted when she was 95 years old. So, you know, these treatments aren't necessarily about prolonging life. These treatments are about quality of life, and many people who don't feel well with heart rhythm problems, these treatments can really make a big difference. And in fact, if you look at ablation, for example, in the octogenarian population, there's a lot of studies that have shown that people in their 80s derive the greatest benefit from ablation because the drugs, especially the antiarrhythmics, are so toxic as you get older. It's an important thing to keep in mind is age is not necessarily a cutoff. And many people are told that. So if we go back to Esther, you know, this is the next day after her ablation procedure. She literally couldn't move before the ablation. We have her smiling here, and this is during COVID, so you have me wearing a mask. AFib is a progressive disease. It requires an integrated, holistic approach. And if you suspect you have AFib or a family member, or you think you could be at risk, talk to your doctor, your primary care physician. If you have a cardiologist, talk with your cardiologist. Immediately seek out a heart rhythm specialist. There are many ways to reach an electrophysiologist. A great website is upbeat.org and we'll put that in the notes, upbeat.org, it will allow you to search for an electrophysiologist wherever you are. And with telemedicine now, we are able to do consults with people halfway across the world. And so that is an important thing that has really made a difference for us in terms of caring for patients. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, having a health condition is a combination of accepting it, having hope, and having a game plan. And a game plan involves having a playbook. And I was, so concerned about so many people being told nothing can be done for their AFib. We hear that all the time as electrophysiologists. One day I was walking a gentleman out of my office and he just started crying. And the reason why he was crying was he was told by two other doctors nothing could be done. He had to live with his AFib. We were able to get him into rhythm and it took a certain strategy. And he just said to me, he said, I wish I had known about this earlier. And so that inspired me to write a book, which is kind of a how-to guide if you get diagnosed, or if you're at risk, or you have a family member, or even for healthcare providers, this is what you do. And many of the illustrations you've seen in this talk are actually from the book from a medical illustrator that I worked with. And the goal of the book is really to provide a combination of storytelling with science and really a humanistic, integrative approach. As I mentioned before, I've had my own health issues. I've had to go out and research the internet and talk to people. And it's a maze out there in our healthcare system. So you need credible information. And that's really what it's all about. Thank you so much for joining me on this webinar today. My website is drasimdesai.com. There's lots of information there. There's a blog, additional articles. You can follow me on social media at Dr. Asim Desai, which is I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. I have a YouTube channel. And there you can see my email. So I. We'll take a look here now at the questions and see see what we have. Yeah, and um, Jody or Mandy, actually Mandy, I think, will read them to you so you don't have to worry about reading them out. And we appreciate all of that wonderful information uh, and we're excited to get the questions answered. If you all are listening and you have a question, please feel free to go ahead and type it in the chat box. 
and uh, we will get to as many as we can. Mandy, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'm here. Andrea, I couldn't get my uh, video to come on, just as an FYI. Um, that was a wonderful presentation, Dr. Desai. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, an anonymous attendee asked if, um, if on meds for AFib, can there be too low of a heart rate? Absolutely. So many of the drugs that we use for AFib to treat the fast heart rate slow the heart rate. They're designed to slow the heart rate, but the problem is, is if your own electrical system is um, abnormal and has a propensity to lower the heart rate, the meds can aggravate it. So we think about symptoms. So if your heart rate is 50 and you're able to exercise and you can get your heart rate up and no problem, then that's okay. But if your heart rate's 40 or 50 and it stays that way and you're trying to do things and you feel faint, you feel exhausted, then that's too low. And that may be a case where if you need to be on that medicine, a pacemaker may be a, a reasonable option to help boost that heart rate. Thank you. Joanne wondered if you could clarify, what's PVC? That's yeah, a great question, Joanne. So PVC is a, a, a premature ventricular contraction. It's one of the most common causes of skipping heartbeats or palpitations that people get. And it's essentially an extra beat from the bottom chambers of the heart that are out of sync with the normal heartbeat. In many cases, they're benign. If they're associated with structural heart disease like heart attack or heart failure prior heart surgery, they can be a risk factor for cardiac arrest. So you do need to do a kind of a risk analysis if people have PVC. In many cases, PVCs can be treatable with reducing caffeine and alcohol, increasing hydration, and taking magnesium. Thank you. Um, Hazen says, I've had or have severe sleep apnea and cannot tolerate a CPAP. So um, she has an oral device made by a dental specialist that seems to be helping. She was recently ablated. Will apnea still be a major factor or problem uh, regarding AFib? I don't know if that's too specific for you to answer for a patient or... No, that's a great question, Hazen, and thank you for that because you, you, you really highlight the importance of sleep apnea. So I'm so glad to hear that you're getting treatment and you're not alone. There are so many people that can't tolerate CPAP. And, Anyone who has sleep apnea or has gone through a sleep study and is being told, you know, they should be on CPAP and you don't tolerate it, definitely follow up with your doctor, follow up with whoever your sleep person is, because there are many options. Sometimes not tolerating it is a, is a result of the pressure settings or the mask fit, that type of thing. So I would encourage you to think about some way of monitoring your sleep apnea with that device, with your doctor to say, how many events am I having now with the dental appliance in place? Is there a way of measuring that? And there's different ways of doing that at home or in office. And it's important to do that after an AFib ablation because it will reduce your chance of AFib recurrence if that sleep apnea is properly managed. But by having your treatment for sleep apnea before your ablation, you are already ahead of the game because you've helped improve your outcome as a result. Thank you. Elaine wonders, can you clarify the difference between pacemakers and implantable monitors? Yeah, thanks for your question, Elaine. So, so a pacemaker is a device, typically there's one or two wires that are inserted in the heart. As I mentioned, there's loopless ones now. And so they're within the body and they're designed to look at the heartbeat beat to beat and deliver an electrical stimulus if the heartbeat goes too slow, simply put. An implantable monitor is not within the body, it's under the skin. So its job is just to be a monitor. It doesn't treat, it just records. And besides AFib, it also records pauses in the heartbeat and other rhythm issues. If someone has unexplained fainting, for example, one cause of that is low heart rate and the heart rate can be low for a few seconds and then go back to normal. And that's an important point, sort of a separate note, is that unexplained fainting is an indication in many cases to get your heart rhythm checked out because if your heart rhythm is not working properly, that could be a cause of the fainting and often a pacemaker is needed in that setting. So one is for treatment and one is for diagnosis. And to follow up on your earlier question, uh, Becky is um, wondering if she should be concerned if her heart rate dips below 40 beats per minute while she's sleeping. She gets her info from her Apple Watch. That's a great question, Becky. So, you know, the Apple Watch and the Cardio Mobile are sort of a mixed blessing. So it, it, they've given a lot of great information for patients and for physicians, the challenge is sifting through all that. And so without sp speaking directly to your case, you know, without knowing the details, um, generally speaking, we look for symptoms related to low heart rate, lightheadedness, fatigue, 
it is common for the heart rate to, to drop at night. That's a normal physiologic process. There's no reason why your heart should beat fast when you're sleeping. That's due to the vagus nerve. So as long as your heart rate is going up with exercise, that's a good sign. Now, sometimes the heart rate can get too low at night, and sometimes that can cause a problem. So that's where you really want to have one of those advanced rhythm monitors you know, considered and have a discussion with your doctor about that, because that can elicit whether, because all you're getting is information is heart rate. And what we really want to know is what's going on with the heart rhythm, because they're, they're different. They're related, but different. Are you in sinus bradycardia at night? Are you having three second pauses? Like those things you can elicit with a heart rhythm monitor. And so the Apple Watch is helpful, um, but just keep all of that sort of in mind when you're, when you're analyzing the data. Tim wonders, is the percentage, um, what's the percentage of, uh, rate chance for a patient who has B-fib with a pacemaker to develop AFib? Thanks for your question, Tim. So if you have, if someone has V-fib, for example, has had an autocot, so ventricular fibrillation is equivalent to a, a cardiac arrest. And so if a person survived that, which nowadays more and more people are because of bystander CPR and AEDs, then they often will get an implantable defibrillator. And an implantable defibrillator is a device that contains a pacemaker unit in it, but then has the ability to shock the heart back into rhythm, save life if, if V-fib develops. So by default, having a history of ventricular arrhythmias means that that person has heart disease. And when you have heart disease, you're at increased risk for AFib, significant increased risk of AFib, because the same disease process that causes ventricular arrhythmias is associated with the AFib disease process, that is scar tissue. Scar tissue as a result of a heart attack, as a result of aging, as a result of genetics. When that scar tissue gets in the electrical system, that's what it causes the problem. It causes ventricular arrhythmias, it causes atrial arrhythmias. It also causes our heartbeat to get too low and causes six sinus syndrome, AV block. And so I hope I've answered that question that there is an increased risk of AFib with any type of heart disease, including a history of VFib, including uh, defibrillators. Uh, the risk is really dependent on a variety of factors, but that left atrial size on echo, that is a really important number to know. Uh, for any patient who has a fib or wants to know their risk. I hope that I can do justice to this question. Uh, Robin asks, well, first he compliments you on your great graphs and information. Thank you. But does the Watchman device correct blood stroke, blood clot, or blood clot and stroke risk yet leave the heart with AFib? If so, is there a danger for the heart health regarding AFib that remains? I don't know. You might want to read that question, doctor, just to Right, right, yeah, Robin, and thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that question and, and the compliment. So, with regards to stroke prevention in AFib, okay, so we have blood thinners, anticoagulants, and they affect different parts of the clotting cascade, and that includes warfarin, that includes um, Xeralto, Eliquis, Pradaxa. We have antiplatelet agents, which are aspirin and Plavix and drugs like that that are often used for coronary stents. So. Antiplatelet agents have not been shown to have a strong benefit in the setting of stroke prevention for AFib. There is a role for aspirin in certain cases, but people often ask, is Plavix enough to prevent stroke? And the answer is the data doesn't support that. You really need to look at one of these other blood thinners that focuses on a particular part of the clotting cascade. But there are many people that can't take blood thinners. They've had a brain bleed or they fall frequently and they may be at risk for trauma. And so these, there are different devices. There's the Watchman device, there's the atria clip, there's left atrial appendage occlusion devices. That's what these are all called. And they are used for one reason, and that is to prevent any blood clots from the left atrial appendage, which is in the left side of the heart, from traveling to the rest of the body, including the brain. They don't do anything for the rhythm. So the person can be a normal rhythm or AFib or evolve into any of those arrhythmias. That device is not going to do anything for the heart rhythm. It's acting as a basket. It's acting as basically a, a filter. So it doesn't allow anything to, to, to get through, if you will. And it's not perfect, but and it's not superior to blood thinners. It's an important thing to know. And so recommendations are generally that if someone has a contraindication to a blood thinner, definitely be considered for something like Watchmen. If someone is tolerating a blood thinner and doing okay on it, then it's a little bit of a gray zone right now as to you know, who should be getting Watchmen and who shouldn't, but it's a great piece of technology. And I'm not sure if I fully answered that question. 
Um, you know, if I, I... I'll keep an eye and see, um, Robin, if we did it, just put something in the chat box or in the yeah. question answer. Yeah. Danielle has an excellent question. We'll go on to that and then I'll check. Her son has a congenital heart defect and they're on today because his cardiologist said um, that he's a high risk for AFib. He's got dextrocardia and a single ventricle. So he advised them to monitor their heart rate regularly. Um, he's seven. So do you have any ideas about the best way for them to do that? Would you recommend that he wear a, a smart watch or what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and, and you know, um, sending positive wishes for your son that I, I hope that he continues to, to do well. Um, and that's the thing with kids is that anyone who has congenital heart disease as they get to be an adult, atrial fib is just part of that picture. So it is key to really be monitoring for it. So, you know, it's a tough question to answer, obviously, because I don't know the specifics and I think it's worth definitely a question to the cardiologist. What is the best way of monitoring, especially with your son being seven? You know, the Apple Watch and the Cardio Mobile and these different devices, they have limits. They only will detect rhythms or call rhythms out if it's below a certain heart rate. So if something's above 120 or 130, I don't remember the specifics, but if it's above a certain rate, it's not going to actually tell you like what's going on. And that's where sometimes implantable monitors are very useful because those are very sophisticated devices. We use those in young, I'm not a pediatric electrophysiologist, but our PZP colleagues use those. Peds, uh, patients also get pacemakers and a variety of other things. So it would be something, if the cardiologist feels like it's really high risk, it's sort of like, well, when would it be high risk? Is it when he's eight or 10 or 15 or 20? Like to get a sense of that, and, and I would definitely consider a periodic external rhythm monitoring. Something like a zeal patch is really easy because it just goes right on the skin. So those are the questions to consider asking the cardiologist is like, what's the best way of monitoring? And specifically, is the Apple Watch going to be enough? If, if, if we were talking about an adult, it would be a different story. But for, for a child, I think it needs to be kind of looked at a little bit differently because the heart rate cutoffs are different and the watch can only tell you so much. This is a good one, I think, for a lot of heart patients in general, but any tips on losing weight for AFib patients who are tired or struggle to do a lot of exercise? Thank you for asking. That's a great question because just so you know, my wife and I struggle with the same thing. So everyone struggles with, with weight, you know, especially during COVID. So, and, and that's not to minimize uh, weight challenges for people by any means, but it is a universal struggle. We know that about 80% of weight loss is related to diet, what you eat. And so I think the key is you want to get into a positive upward spiral. You want to create micro steps. You want an accountability plan. You want an accountability partner. You've got to make it simple. Even if it's something as simple as, you know, making a decision to, you know, not have dessert, making a decision to eat at a certain time of day and not eat after 8 p.m. Make those small changes and over time that will really have an incremental impact and as you start losing the weight then you have more energy then you want to do more and then when you exercise and you feel better you're going to automatically want to eat healthier so i'll just tell a personal story you know my wife actually has been using weight watchers and uh we both have and um the app is amazing i mean the the meals the the, the different choices and it's really easy to track and it's a, it's a great way in a sort of cost savings way to kind of start the weight loss process. You know, definitely intermittent fasting, there's some pretty good data on that, just kind of conglomerating the times a day you eat. You know, as far as keto and Atkins and things like that, there's a, the jury's out on those. I, I would say there is some pretty good data on vegan or vegetarian diets in terms of just overall health but as far as weight loss goes, I would really focus on the diet and the food and you know, look into some of these different options. I think Weight Watchers, I mean, there's so many celebrities now that have really become spokespeople for Weight Watchers. And it, it really, having seen personal effect of it, I, I really think it's a, it's a great way to go. I hope that helps. Another question asks, are there specific dietary recommendations to prevent or treat AFib? Yeah, it's a great question. So you always want to think about potassium and magnesium because those are important electrolytes in the heart rhythm. So now if you have kidney failure, if you're a dialysis patient, you have to be careful because those can accumulate in the body. So before you do anything, definitely talk with your doctor. 
But foods that are high in potassium and magnesium in particular are good for heart rhythm patients, including patients with AFib. Caffeine, alcohol, not good. Would definitely try to avoid, you know, caffeine is kind of one of those mixed things that one cup maybe, it, it's hard to say on a one-to-one on -one basis, but alcohol is the big one that we really have just seen over and over again as being a culprit. And so the sugar, you know, sugar, there's not a lot of data on sugar and it's linked to AFib, but it's not a good thing in general. So I would say anything that contributes to weight gain contributes to AFib because there's a lot of data that shows the connection between weight and AFib. And if someone doesn't manage the weight after an ablation, for example, they have a higher recurrence rate of AFib. The people from Australia, the physicians in Australia, have done wonderful studies looking at weight loss programs and how they've impacted AFib patients. And um, we're trying to replicate that in the US. You know, it's, you know, it's a real challenge, obviously, to put all the pieces together, and that's why it's important to empower yourself. But if I had you know, one recommendation as far as diet goes, it would be to like, look at some of the foods that are high in potassium and magnesium, check it out with your doctor, make sure there's no issues there. And that would include like green leafy vegetables, that would include unsalted almonds, for example, are a great source. Many drugs deplete the body of potassium and magnesium, and I'm not just talking about diuretics. Proton pump inhibitors, acid blockers, they deplete the body of magnesium. And so, and then the last point is that the blood level of magnesium and potassium is not an accurate reflection of, of your needs because only about 1% is stored in the bloodstream, mostly stored in the tissue. So many of our patients who have rhythm issues, whether it's the premature ventricular contractions or AFib, we will advise to take magnesium even with a normal magnesium level. You know, the downside is really GI upside. You can't really get toxic on it unless you have advanced kidney disease. So hope that helps. I think we have time for one more, if we can sneak this in. Andrew is then gonna finish up for us. Does AFib usually come after a ROS procedure? I don't know if that's too specific or not for you to speak to. Yeah, you know, I, I it's a procedure done for, for congenital heart disease. I would make a, a kind of a more general statement, which is any surgery on the heart, there's going to have to be careful about saying black and white things. In many cases, surgery on the heart, it, it's an, the, the heart disease itself, the surgery, it just over time, additional with aging process and other risk factors, increases a person's risk of AFib. So any heart patient who's had surgery, like right off the bat, it increased risk for AFib. It's a risk factor. Uh, I know I don't know if that answers that question, but I, I think I kind of know what that person was, was going for. I think so. Okay, Andrea. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Desai. The information was fantastic. We really appreciate you spending the hour with us. Um, the presentation along with these slides will be available on the website, um, mendisheart.org, uh, tomorrow, later afternoon. If you just